Moments ago, we heard Jeff read a scripture from the Old Testament, and it was the call of Moses. It was a defining moment in, in his life, in his ministry. And now we've got yet another defining moment in the life of Jesus. Let's read from the Gospel. From Luke we read, When Jesus came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom, and he stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because He has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, and to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then Jesus rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And then Jesus began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. And once again, a defining moment in Jesus' life. Let me begin with a little story. There was, there was a young, or excuse me, there was an older American couple who were traveling through Europe one summer. They were on one of these tours with a, a whole boatload of other people. And it seemed that at every village, every town, every city that they made an appearance at, the tour guide would spend some time talking about the great men and women that had been born in that community. Make sense? Maybe you've been on these tours yourself. Well, shortly after arriving at a small village in Germany, this couple kind of jumped the gun. They saw a passerby in the street and they asked one of the locals, Can you tell us, who were the great men and women that were born here in your community? And without any hesitation, the, the reply came back, none. He said, great men and women are not born great. They only become great later in life. What do you think about that? Great men and women are not born great. They only become great later in life. Now, you and I may argue the semantics of that, but I want to suggest to you this morning that this may well be true. None of the heroes that you and I hold up in life, none of the people that we've read about or heard about or known, none of them were born great. They, they may have been born with great gifts and talents and abilities and resources, but I tell you, it's not those gifts and talents and resources that made them great. No, in each of their lives, there was a turning point. They had to make some decisions. They had to accept some responsibility. They rose to a challenge. You might they say they stepped out in courage and faith. But none of these people were born great. You know, most people that I know in life, and tell me if this is the same for you, most people that I know in life are not seeking greatness. We're not really seeking more responsibility. In fact, most of us would just like to travel through life at our own comfort level, at our own pace. Most of us don't want other people depending upon us. And even like Moses in today's reading that you heard Jeff share, we don't usually see ourselves as capable or qualified or interested in accepting a call to go and to do or to be something. Most of us, like Moses, have that same response of, Lord, who am I to go before Pharaoh? I'm nobody important. I'm not talented. I'm not gifted. I, in fact, I don't have the gift of speech. I'm slow in tongue and speech. Lord, there must be somebody else for this job. Please ask somebody else. But what I'm here today to, to say is this. Great people like Moses are those people that are finally persuaded. Persuaded that there is nobody else, or at least nobody like them. And that if they don't do the job, then it looks like nobody will. And so again, greatness comes not from anything that Moses or you or I are ever born with, but it comes through our willingness, our openness, our courage, and our faith to be used by God for something greater than just ourselves. Friends, you know the man that we're here today to remember, to honor, and to celebrate, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., is no exception to that. And I tell you, Dr. King was not born great or a hero. He didn't aspire to greatness. In fact, if you were to read some of the records from uh, his early years, his father, Daddy King, would say, you know, for a preacher's kid, he was kind of a rebel in the family. 
Martin was certainly born with intelligence and talent and potential and resources. And yet, listen to this. When he accepted his first job as a pastor, when he accepted his first call at Dexter Avenue Baptist Church in Montgomery, Alabama, he simply wanted to surround himself, and this is right from his writings, he wanted to surround himself with his family, with his books, with his church, and listen to this. He wanted to live a comfortable life. And you and I know God had other th plans for him. And you see, it was about that time that Rosa Parks, who, by the way, Dr. King did not yet know, had just come to national recognition because, you know, it was her act of civil disobedience by refusing to give up her, her seat on a bus. And it was about in that time that the bus boycott was in its infancy in the South. And Dr. King was asked not only to join in the bus boycott, but he was asked to lead the bus boycott. Now listen, you must know this. This is an important point today. Dr. King was very reluctant to get involved. He didn't want the bother. He didn't want the pressure. He didn't want the responsibility. It was only after a new friend, another black Baptist preacher by the name of Ralph Abernathy, it was only after Ralph Abernathy called him up and exhorted him over the, uh, over the importance of his participation and his cooperation that finally Dr. King very hesitantly said yes and accepted this responsibility. Friends, throughout history, men and women, boys and girls, have been called to important work Think with me. This is the story we heard today from the Old Testament. Moses was called to what? To lead the Hebrew people out of Egypt. The Apostle Paul was called what? To share the good news of the gospel, not only with Jews, but with Gentiles as well. Martin Luther was called to bring the Bible back to the center of the church. Think of some of the female names. Dorothy Day was a woman that was called to, to do something with the poor and the homeless. Mother Teresa was called to minister to the masses of people in the East and to do something about disease and homelessness and poverty and sickness and illness and to be with people to their dying days. And Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., as we all know, was called to, to lead the struggle for civil rights and human rights, not only in this country but in the world. But I tell you again, none of these people asked for the job. None of these people found this call easy. But the world today is a better place because each of them, in their own way, eventually said what? Yes. Yes. What do you want me to do, Lord? I would imagine that in every age, there are people, human beings, men and women, boys and girls, who see problems looming in the world, whether they're local or whether they're national or worldwide, most people like us, we scratch our head, we ask God, why don't you do something about this? God, when are you going to do something about hunger and poverty and homelessness? When will you do something about domestic abuse and, and racism and discrimination? Lord, when will you do something about the human trafficking going on in our world today? Or economic injustice or, or all the fighting and all the wars in so many different corners of the world. And I would imagine in each and every age, God grins a little bit, maybe shakes his head, smiles, and says, I have done something. I created you. I'm putting you on that problem. So you do something. Don't you sometimes wonder throughout history how many men and women could have made a difference in the world, could have become great people, could have answered the call, but for one reason or another, they said, no, no, I, I'm too busy. I'm not qualified. I'm just not interested. No, I'm not adequate. I'm uneducated. I'm just afraid. Do you ever wonder? They, they say that the, the children of Israel spent 400 years in slavery in Egypt. Did God come to 400 people that, find, that said no, and finally he found a yes in Moses? Is that maybe the way that it worked? But again, the human tendency is to say, no, God, I don't want to do it. There's got to be somebody more acceptable, more gifted, more talented, that could do a better job than I could. Friends of Bethel, I have to ask you this morning an important question. 
if your life, your life and mine, were to come to a sudden end, whenever that would be, what would your life have stood for at this point? What would your life have stood for in this world? And again, I'm not asking you if your life came to an end, where would you go? We know where you'd go. You're, you're, you're a child of Jesus. You, you'd be a part of the kingdom. No, what I'm asking you is if your life came to a, a sudden end, what's the value that you have brought into this world? Into this community, into this church, into your neighborhood, into this state? What have you stood for all these years? Or in the few years that you've lived? And is the world, is the community... Is it a better place because you've lived? We all aspire to great things in our lives, or we all aspire to, to certain values and, and things that we would like to achieve. Most of us want to raise a family. Most of us want to earn a good living. We want to be comfortable in life. We want to maybe do some traveling at some point. Each of these, these things are fine and admirable goals. But I would ask you this morning, could it be that sometimes in life our dreams and our visions limit us, dwarf us from perhaps what God has in store for us? We allow our own comforts and our own desires to get in the way because sometimes maybe we just play life a little bit too safe. You know, it's doubtful that I will ever make a difference in the world sitting in front of my television set. Would you agree? Doubtful. And we probably won't make much of a dent in the world's suffering by laying on a beach or walking a golf course. And I would venture to say we may never save a life by attending a concert or going to a ball game or going to see a movie. We probably won't do much for the human race with those things. But I tell you, each and every day, God calls human beings like you and like me beyond these, these good things of life to do even greater things, even better things, as we serve God and as we serve God's people. It was in a speech in 1963 in Detroit, Michigan, that Dr. King said this. Tell me what you think. If a person hasn't discovered something that he's willing to die for, well, then he isn't fit to live. Is that a little over the top? What do you think? A little radical? If a person hasn't discovered something he's willing to die for, then he isn't fit to live. You know, there were times in Dr. King's life and ministry where people said, slow down, Martin, this is dangerous. Take it easy. Back off. Be careful. This could get you killed. And it was then that Dr. King said, every now and then I think about my own death. I think about my own funeral. If any of you are around when I meet my day, I don't want a long funeral. If you get somebody to deliver the eulogy, tell them not to talk too long. But every now and then, I wonder what I would like them to say at my funeral. Tell them not to mention that I've got a Nobel Peace Prize. That's not important. Tell them not to mention that I have three or four hundred other awards. That's not important. But on that day, I would like somebody to mention that Dr. King tried to give his life serving others. On that day, I'd like somebody to say that Martin Luther King Jr. tried to love somebody. On that day, I'd like somebody to be able to get up and say, I tried to feed the hungry. I'd like somebody to say, I tried to clothe that were naked in the world. I want you to be able to say on that day of my funeral that I did try to visit the people in prison. I tried to love and serve humanity. And then he ended this little speech with these words. He said, I won't have any money left behind. I won't have the fine and luxurious things of life to leave behind but I just want to leave a committed life behind. That was it. That was, his, that was his goal, his dream. I just want to leave a committed life behind. And friends, you know, he did. That's why we're here today, and we're so glad for that. When I look around this sanctuary today, and I see each of you, younger, older, newer people here at Bethel, folks that have been around for decades, I know this, I know as a fact. It may be today, it may be tomorrow, this week, next week, next month, but sooner or later, just about every one of us is going to be asked to step up in life. We're going to be asked to take on a new responsibility. That could be in your neighborhood, that could be at the school, that could be at the church, it could be in the state. It, it, who knows? It, it, maybe you're one that will be asked to, to help out at the food shelf. 
Or you'll be asked to serve on the United Way board. Maybe it's something as simple and yet scary as teaching Sunday school. Maybe you'll be challenged to, to get on one of the mission trips. And maybe that's just across country in Pine Ridge uh, in South Dakota. Or maybe that's going to Tanzania. Maybe you'll be called to serve on the school board or the city council. But I tell you this, when that call comes, and it will come, it will be easy to say no. It will be easy to make excuses and say, this is not the right time, this is not the right call. It will be easy to try to pass the call off on somebody else. Or you and I can step up. We can answer the call. We can move beyond ourselves. We can move outside of our comfort level to do something of a greater good. You and I know, we may not be as talented or as gifted as Dr. King was. We may not be asked to sacrifice in the same way Dr. King was. We may not achieve national or international success and fame and notoriety like he did. And we may not change the world, the country. But I tell you this, in our own small way, you and I can all become great in God's eyes. We can become faithful in God's eyes as we change maybe just one life. It's never too late and it's never too little. But I tell you again, when the call comes, and it will come, may you and I have the courage and the faith and the virtue to be able to say, yes, Lord, what do you want me to do? Let's pray. Lord, on this morning, we thank you again that you believe in us more than we sometimes believe in ourselves. We thank you that you use people like us to change lives, change the world. And so, God, in these opportunities, give us the courage and the faith and the virtue to have that spirit that says, with you, we can do it. These things we ask, these things we pray, these things we believe on this day as the people of God. And let all the people together say, Amen.